Welcome back into The Mental Game, where this week's guest is actress Allison Stoner. It just all, like one after the other, significantly difficult things happened. And I, you know, found myself thinking about ending everything. And in this episode, Allison opens up about her acting career, which got started when she was just a kid in Hollywood, starring in Cheaper by the Dozen, Step Up, Camp Rock, and so much more. But she also talks about her mental health journey, struggling with anxiety, depression, her eating disorder, having to check into rehab, and even having suicidal thoughts. All of that and much, much more coming up in this amazing conversation with her. But first, I want to tell you about man therapy. And guys, I am talking to you because, look, we have to be comfortable being vulnerable and talking about our mental health. And that's why I want you to go to mantherapy.org to find amazing tools and resources to take care of your mental health. But now it is time for the latest episode here on The Mental Game with Allison Stoner. Welcome back into The Mental Game. As you can see, I got a very special guest sitting next to me here in LA, actress Allison Stoner. Thank you so much for coming on The Mental Game. Thanks for having me. You are a big, passionate mental health advocate, and I can't wait to dive into your whole story. You know, from all your time here out here in LA, you know, you got started real young as a child actor on on shows like Cheaper by the Dozen and movies, obviously the Step Up franchise and Camp Rock. People know your face, love you, but you've also been super open and vulnerable. And so first off, I just wanted to say thank you for Mm, that. Absolutely. Thank you. And thank you for being willing to have conversations about this because we can have our highlight reel all day long or only talk about things that are quote unquote accomplishments. But I think some of my greatest quote unquote accomplishments are the fact that I know how to regulate my nervous system now and not fall into the pit of despair as frequently. (laughs) I love that. It's like it's taking, you know, we talked a little bit before we started rolling the rock bottoms, getting out of that and how to Mm -hmm. work on ourselves. That's what I'm the most proud of too, I think, in my personal life is how we climb out. Um, First thing I ask everyone here on The Mental Game is what does mental health mean to you? And obviously, as you know, it's a very individual thing. We experience it all differently. Maybe there's stuff early in our life that triggers certain things, but I'll ask you the same thing. What does it mean to you? I'm curious if anyone has answered this with something about 4E cognition before. I've done over 50 episodes and I've never heard that now. Perfect. Okay, Okay. yes. Give it to me. (laughs) So, and I'm by no means an expert. Everyone fact checked me. This is my paraphrase of one approach and framework of viewing and understanding what happens in our our mental processes. Um, But essentially, a lot of times I think when we think about mental health, we locate everything in Mm -hmm. the mind and brain and we think it all happens neck up. However, a lot of frameworks are starting to showcase how the mind is embedded in the body and what's happening in the body deeply impacts what's happening upstairs, quote unquote upstairs. Um, But also we're embedded in an environment, a physical environment and a social environment. And that also influences the mental health of the individual or the mental processes. Um, And beyond that, it's Uh, extends into things like devices that now kind of have little brains within them. Yeah. We can transfer down. I can download some of my mental processes in a text message, send it to you, and you can carry in some ways a little piece of my mind (laughs) forever in your phone. (laughs) Um, So when I think about mental health, I really look at the holistic viewpoint of Mm -hmm. the mind and brain being embedded in this embodied and embedded environment. Um, And if I don't look at all of those variables, I feel like I tend to have a narrow perception and and I tend to make decisions from a very limited point of view. You got to factor in all of it. Sure. And that's, well, one, you gave a very unique answer. You were right. as the first person to bring Good, that up. I'm glad. <laughs> but I, I always talk about how mental health is just like physical health. You can obviously combine the two and kind of what you're talking about. But if you broke your leg, 
running in a basketball game mm -hmm. or you fell off the stage during a performance, like you'd go to the doctor that night. Wouldn't think twice. Yeah, wouldn't think twice. But when it's, you know, our, our mental health for a long, long time, we didn't talk about it. So I, I love that answer. I think there's a lot of connectivity there. I want to get into that here in just a sec. But your story with you being out here starting, you know, in the entertainment business at a very young age, um, I think shaped your journey and you've been very open about it before. Mm -hmm. um, do you remember your first audition or what kind of it was like Oof. to get out here and experience <laughs> things for the first time? Well, so I'm in my 30s now and I was three when I started performing uh, and I was seven when I became a professional uh, in Los Angeles. And while I don't remember all of the details of yeah. my first audition, I do know it was for a show called Becker um, that starred, I believe, Ted Danson, who played a, a doctor with sort of a poor bedside manner. And I remember getting a call back, which was exciting. Um, but the third audition is what really stood out to me. It was for a Shirley Temple biopic. Oh, and wow. I happened to be a huge fan of Shirley's movies and music. Yeah. So I, uh, you know, felt like, wow, this this might be it already. I mean, there were ten thousand girls who sure. were auditioning. Literally, they did a nationwide search wow. over ten thousand girls. Um, but some of the things I remember are just being in what they call cattle calls, mm -hmm. where you're a just a human with a number, contestant number, and you kind of like don't even feel like a real person. You're right. just trying to earn back having a name um, by leaving an impression. And the stakes are so high. And it's also like drop everything and be here. And if not, then you're going to lose the opportunity. And so some of that nervous energy and intensity really became my norm. Mm -hmm. And I sort of put, put myself or was placed onto a hamster wheel and that didn't stop for many, many years. Yeah, well, getting into it, and I, you see it through so many, you know, movie stars or, or kids that work on TV shows. This is a very, very common theme mm -hmm. that you hear on and on and on. But in your personal life, you had to, you were born in Ohio. I'm Ohio too, from Cincinnati. You're from Toledo. You move out here. I mean, you weren't going to school anymore. Like it, back home, you probably you know missed your friends. Like did did that? Like the excitement of of getting these auditions had to be really cool at that young age. But what was the personal side effects just at a young age leaving your friends and family? Yeah, that's a great question. So you named some of the social aspects. Um, when you're that young, since you don't have any other map of reality yet, yeah, you aren't really conceptualizing how you're allocating your hours in the day. You're just in the car going yep. wherever the guardian is driving you yeah. and you're doing the task in front of you that the adult is asking you to do. Um, so in hindsight, I can see how I slowly kind of had this eclipse where I was in work environments with adults more frequently and lesser and lesser I was around, you know, people my age. Right. If they were my age, they were also professionals. Mm -hmm. There was not really much... Um, you know, playtime, you yeah. know, there wasn't like frivolous, just There's not recess. imagination. Yeah. Uh, but on the flip side, because it was a creative work environment, I did get to flex these beautiful muscles of play and yeah. imagination. Um, but there was still an output measurement. Mm -hmm. And so I think that performance driven mentality is something that I'm sure many people can uh, relate to sure. whether it's grades or high expectations from your family or um, perhaps you know it, you're in an athletic program and that becomes your identity yeah. and you're like all right what am I gonna do without this this is the only pace I know no pain no gain push 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 and outdo yourself gotta be exceptional and so I think that also was a part of the narrative mm. that if someone labeled you once upon a time as special or that you stood out, then yeah. there was this pressure to maintain yeah. or surpass that. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think uh, when it comes to attachment relation relationally, I noticed that being in the entertainment industry often encompasses moving around a lot yep. for projects for three months at a time or um, perhaps just moving to different parts of town to be closer to studios and mm -hmm. auditions. And I found that on sets or when I got to go to school for a micro, you know, period of time, I would bond deeply with people only to have to deeply break the bond mm. and never see them again. Right. 
And I found that that led to me sort of becoming hyper independent and just not really letting many people in. Yeah. Like I could have conversations like this where we're, you know, spitballing and right. there's a lot of detail and substance. Sure. But, you know, it's not like I'm vulnerably opening my heart. Right. Right. When it came to actually deepening trust mm -hmm. and building that kind of intimacy with people, that was a whole different layer. Yeah. Because um, the persona was sort of spearheading things. Right. So, yeah. Well, well you want to keep going, keep, like you said, kind of keep that pace of getting yeah. jobs, getting on shows. For you, you saw success at a very young age. I mentioned some of the shows at the beginning. My personal favorite is the Missy Elliott uh, music video yeah. just because that's I love her music and that was such a fun video. Mm. But when you look back, I'll use Cheaper by the Dozen, for example, mm. to get that job. How old were you at that time? Ooh, I w think I was around 10 or 11. To have a uh, to get that job, and you at the time probably thought it was big, but didn't realize how big it could be Truly. <laughs> when it came out. Um, what was that process like when you start to see? Would you consider that your first like big big show or big big job? It was my first film, and I must say yes. We're talking about the highlights first, so don't worry. There's a lot of other <laughs> layers to this, but um, it was my first film, and I don't think anyone could have predicted the blockbuster nature of it yeah i at my age then didn't really know who steve martin and bunny hunt and all of the people were but clearly fox knew what they were doing mm -hmm. and it was it, st it stands the test of time people still watch it for during the holidays um but i think maybe around missy elliott it was a bit of a breakthrough moment and gotcha. then there was a, a couple of shows on disney one called mike super short show that placed my um my image in households. And so I started noticing now I'm being stopped on the street and yeah. I've got to be a little more self-conscious sure. um, around what what I'm doing, um, my mannerisms and my tone of speech and even if people are taking photos without me knowing, am I making silly faces right. and stuff, kinds of stuff like that. And then of course the criticism um, that comes with it. But uh, Cheaper was a, a big moment um, I remember going back to Ohio and it was it was interesting because Toledo had always been home only. Mm. It had only been associated with family, loved ones, my early years in school. Yeah. And then when I went back as someone who had been on television and in film, people's orientation toward me shifted, mm. which is normal and to be expected, but suddenly it felt like almost my home had turned into a press tour stop. Ooh. And instead of settling in and hanging out with my dad, who still lives there, I was going from the tree lighting ceremony to the mm. special appearance at the theater to, and I didn't know at the time because it was just so exciting and there was so much beauty in it. Like, yeah. I'm not going to say it was all negative, but I didn't understand that so many of my just normal healthy developmental milestones right. were starting to get disrupted because I was becoming a, a full-time working adult at seven or 10. Well, at, at 10, 11, 12 years old, when Cheaper comes out, the, you do the Missy Elliott video and you're talking about even going home. That's such a thing that I wouldn't think about, but it mm -hmm. is true. You get invited to do all these events, tree lightings, maybe uh, I'm thinking like throw out the first pitch at something or drop the right, puck right, at a sporting yeah. event, things like that. But Which is cool. Yeah, yeah. It's, like, it's fun. <laughs> but you also want to be normal and like enjoy right, your your, yeah. your years as a kid hmm. did you start to notice any feeling of like just being alone or feeling different when when you did go home and those things happened yes and it was in all the small moments I had a, a sleepover with the young girl who you know I just adored um from our dance studio and she had her other friends over and you know they all had matching friendship bracelets because they all hung mm. out all the time yeah. meanwhile i had been gone and um and then they pulled a little prank on me and i happened to fall asleep first because i had to get up and go work <laughs> meanwhile the other kids got to sleep in you know and i was like sorry i got a gig yeah. um and they ended up like you know stuffing my clothes with scrunchies and other things and that in that small little moment i felt like oh am i am i di am i different now than I once was to her? Am I mm -hmm. no longer just buddy down the street? Uh, and and if so, who am I and 
can I be, can I fit in? Can I be normal? Yeah. Um, but as I started to interact with more and more kids my age who weren't in the industry and I'm doing things like signing autographs or they're asking me for advice, I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. I've never done this before. Yeah. I'm still your age. But um, it did become fairly isolating because it was just unrelatable. Right. It's not that it was always hyper negative um, or always challenging, like a lot of tremendously beautiful experiences. But when it comes to just being able to con connect and say, hey, remember when we went to prom? No. Uh, do you remember when you, you know, went to college? No. Do you yeah. remember what it's like to go on a first date and not have a camera person taking photos? No. I don't. I don't know what that's like. Um, so you just kind of felt like an odd duck, mostly. That, you bring it up, prom, college, simple first date, like things like yeah. that, I think for anyone listening or watching would be like, oh, no problem at all. Mm. But when you're in this industry and you're working through those ages and you're not going to school, like you do miss out on huge life moments. And we, you mentioned the word highlight. And I don't want to say low light, put those next to each other, mm -hmm. but just the parallel life that you're living of rising in, in the film industry sure. and on TV and in dance. And then also the more pressure and maybe the obstacles that come up on the inside. Mm. How did you handle that balancing act when you are starting to get more jobs? And I've heard you in the past say that you said yes to mm. almost everything yeah. because you wanted those opportunities or felt like you couldn't say no. Right, right. How did you go on that balancing walk um, when you were making it, but on the inside you did have some of that empty alone feeling? Oof, well, yes. So we've spoken about you know all the things that look fun on the outside, there is a whole other set of variables that are going on um, just day to day in the industry, in any industry. Sure. Um, just work hours alone. You know, young people working and rehearsing for 20 hours and the, the training is intense. We're not talking just like sit here and learn how to cry on cue. It's like intense physical training plus visceral emotional catharsis, thinking about traumatizing things. Yep. And then like, you know, really hands-on physical work. It's, it's, and I, again, I'm not saying this is the hardest job. It's just, it was actually way more involved than I think people understand from the outside yeah. looking in. Um, but then the aspect of um, having an audience is a really, it's strange. Sure, yeah. And so the audience may feel a connection to you, but you've never met them. Mm -hmm. um, but, but, you become this sort of, uh, I don't want to say target because that seems like it's automatically negative, but you become a chance for people to project whatever they want onto yeah. you. So to some, you're a hero. To some, you're a villain. To some, you are, uh, you know, so talented. To others, you are overrated and you should never be hired again. But when you're a child and you hear actually, not exaggerating, millions of comments about who you are while you haven't formed your own identity yet mm -hmm. or had time to experiment, it gets really confusing. Yeah. And a lot of the criticisms that I heard, of course, I think it happens quite frequently, especially for people like female bodied people, uh, body image related criticisms mm -hmm. and like, you know, why is Allison getting hired? They're so ugly or whatever um which for an eight-year-old is like ouch like why yeah now i'm like eh, okay um but and then you've got on the flip side people who are like praising you and almost inflating your ego right and so it's just sort of like being in a space of extremes mm -hmm. it's like extreme work hours extreme feedback haters fans yeah um and i think the toll for me was, I mean, manifold, but when it came to physical health, I, I should say all of this is happening, but we haven't even touched into what's going on in my personal life. Yeah. Because work took over so much. We haven't even gone into the fact that I'm raised by, there's multiple people dealing with addiction in my family uh, and multiple kinds of abuse going on at home. So you've got chaos at work, chaos at home, and just as a young person, your body's changing and you're like, oh man, like chaos yeah. in my body. And so 
I think the toll there was I, I started looking for what do I have control over? What can I do to cope? And I chose a couple of things that weren't ultimately the healthiest. One, I obsessed over food and exercise. Two, I just dissociated as a survival strategy. Mm. I just went numb. I couldn't really feel anything, high, low, good, bad, none of it. Um, and third, I this was a mostly helpful thing. I sort of like dove into spirituality. But what I didn't realize I was doing at the time with spirituality and, and faith is that I was sort of looking for any out to escape the physical realm. Mm. It wasn't just this pure intention right. of wanting to connect uh, with God or larger, you know, spiritual um, experiences. I, I learned later in hindsight, oh, wow, you just had so much going on in here. Mm -hmm. You looked for every possible path to check out. Yep. <laughs> um, so now... All of those things have been kind of re-oriented, uh, recalibrated, mm -hmm. um, but it takes a lot when you haven't been feeling and then you start to feel a little bit and then suddenly you feel everything. Well, thank you for, for starting to share that chapter of your life on the personal side. And I didn't tell you this before, but like I was an alcoholic. I've been sober mm. for uh, I think 16 months now. And Whoa. so, yeah, that's like big for me, but I came from a family that you know, uh, my dad, I love him to death, but he was a big drinker. His mm -hmm. dad, you know, smoked a ton. Like there was just that yeah. addictive personality, the addiction totally. in our family. So I can understand that part of it. Mm -hmm. How was that challenging to hide? I don't know if hide's the right word, mm -hmm. but you are probably back then, especially the way we talked about mental health back then. You don't want to talk about that with anyone, I'm assuming. Right. you were. It was all zipped up. Yeah. How were you able to compartmentalize and how – Tough, tough was that because as a kid yeah you see stuff and you like I don't know at home I thought stuff was normal because right. I saw it right but then you get out in the real world and you realize oh not everybody goes through this yeah how did you compartmentalize that at that age I mean that's a great question and I don't I don't think I had any of the answers and I don't think that what I did was noble or right by any means it was whatever my kind of survival strategy was for my brain and body. And um, compartmentalize is a great word. I do feel like I just learned to, because I was, I also had a camera filming a lot of yeah. my life. And so I couldn't tell anyone anything, um, even if I wanted to. But I don't know how it was for you in your household. In mine, no one wanted anyone else to know what was going on indoors so you almost had to like uphold the family secret mm -hmm. anyway um so but i think over time i actually kind of believed that it was normal like you said i mm -hmm. that was my only reference point yeah it wasn't until i saw my friend down the street whose family they all like genuinely loved each other in a way that was palpable and there was a glue that held them together and i was like I'm like, what is that? <laughs> like, I just don't recognize this. Mm -hmm. um, and so I started spending time with them and that kind of became a model for knowing something else was possible. But I think in my household, the way I described it is we just all felt like islands. It was mm -hmm. like self-governing islands. We all had our own coping strategies, defense mechanisms, you know, governing laws and like just stay in your world disconnect, don't let anyone in, take care of yourself, don't rely on anyone. And and that's it's sad because that shows up now in my relationships with friends and with partners. Mm -hmm. You know, they're like, it's okay for you to need us sometimes. And I'm like, no, no, it's fine. I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. Yeah. Um so and then I think, you know, what we haven't named is just the amount of shame that I shame and fear just really drove my experience on a daily basis. I think that some of that's normal. You know, you're mm -hmm. growing up and you're like, ah, just I'm trying to figure out what to do right. and how to do it. But um, I think I had a, a lot of fear. I was afraid of, of emotions. I was afraid of messing up and failing. I was afraid of letting down my family and, and team. I was afraid of uh, criticism. And then the shame of just like, if only anyone knew 
how painfully average and human I am. Like, oh no, this would be the end of it all, right? Just like drastic thoughts. Um, and that fear and shame really drove me to some extreme choices. Well, you mentioned the fear and shame and you talked about the obsession with, with food and exercise, mm. which you've been very open about and I think it's helped a lot of people. And if I can dig into that just a little yeah. bit, when did that start? Um, did it come from, we talked about the comments before and hearing from millions of people about your appearance or the way you look or sound. Did mm. that, what played in and led to your eating disorder? You've talked about it a lot and how you, you know, that kind of led you to a rock bottom moment mm -hmm. in your life. Um, what drove you to that, you think? There were a lot of factors, um, a lot of ingredients that it made just the right recipe. One of them is eat it, disordered eating. I wouldn't necessarily say eating disorder, but disordered eating patterns and addiction were already present in mm -hmm. my family, in multiple family members. So some of it's kind of modeled yep. in how we relate to food um, for emotional reasons and control or for other reasons. Um, another aspect is as a performer, um, the pressures with the industry, but also just like if you're an athlete or whatever, you can almost get away with a lot of behaviors and justify it as a part of the job, a mm -hmm. part of the expectation. You are an elite athlete. You can't be anything less than, you know, phenomenal mm -hmm. and in tip top shape at all times. And so in many ways I use that to rationalize my obsessive um, behaviors. And, you know, I was, you know, trigger warning if anyone, anyone deals with this. Um, I, I was restricting my intake with food severely while over exercising tremendously. Mm. And for example, I would have a, a, a 10 hour um, dance rehearsal for a job, but I'd make sure to go to the gym before and after. So, and, and on top of that, not be fueling my body properly, um, all based on this fear of, you know, things that were misperceptions I've now, of course, unpacked. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it was a variety of variables. And of course, there's just um, societal body image yep. uh, standards. And I think for those of us who find ourselves in these ruts, it isn't, sometimes it's one catalyzing event and you can go back and say, oh, after that breakup, then this happened. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also, I think, sometimes just a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and then you you lean on a certain behavior once. It helps temporarily, yep. and so you return to it a second time. Slowly it becomes a habit. Mm -hmm. Now it's a groove in the brain. Now your brain expects it, and your chemistry you know, organizes itself around it. Yep. And it leads to dependence. And the body, in some ways, you think the body's saying, oh, no, no, this is a legitimate need. I need this. And you've got to kind of unwire, rewire. And as you know, like transition to sobriety, you're really, it's a its a biological, a psychological. It's everything. It's, it's everything. And withdrawal symptoms are real and don't just happen with the substances that most people name. I mean, it can't, things can happen when you adjust your diet, mm -hmm. when you are used to scrolling on your phone and you decide to remove that. Like, yeah, we all have these coping devices. Um, and it doesn't have to be a formalized addiction that you hear about to be something that's interfering with, you know, a balanced uh, lifestyle. Well, I'll give you a really, it sounds silly, but like, all I had left of everything that I did in my life was like energy drinks. And I've, mm. have, I've been off of an energy drink for like two weeks and I'm dying for yes, one. Yeah. But I got past day five and six just like when I stopped drinking alcohol. And I'm like, okay, look, dude, it's not that serious, but I know it's not good for me. Yeah. And you can find something else. And so right. instead, I, I take a walk in the morning. You're just, you find yeah. those healthy alternatives. For you, that started while you were what age, would you say? So, um, yes, that's right. So I think my, the seeds of disordered eating were around 11, mm. um, intensified by 13, carried through, um, until around 17. 
And that's when I hit a version of rock bottom. I thought it would be my lowest, but it wasn't. Um, and I knew I, I need treatment. I need to actually go to a facility. Like I tried working with a dietitian. I yep. tried to access therapy. I tried just also self-recovery forums and, and books. And I was like, man, this, this one's, this, this has me, it's yep. got me. Um, and so went into treatment, uh, for over three months, I believe, um, much of that was on bed rest initially, which was hard. Yeah. Um, we weren't even allowed to stand for more than a few seconds, wow. um, or it was considered breaking the rules. Um, so they were really just trying to get, get our bodies back in order. And a lot of us were just truly undernourished, malnourished mm -hmm. and, and needed that kind of, um, intervention. Yeah. Well, well that experience you have, were you at, was there an audition? I think I, I read that maybe an audition that you had that maybe not blaming it on the audition itself, but kind of around that time at 18, you're making this transition from mm. child star yes, yeah. to the reality of trying to make it, you know, your adult career. Mm. Did it, I, 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 did it kind of, those two come together of that maybe identity crisis a little bit or mm -hmm. trying to prove to yourself and to the world that you can still do this as an adult? Do you think that factored into kind of that rock bottom moment? Yes. Um, I actually gave myself an ultimatum um, and I recognized, you know, it's hard to for anyone on the outside to kind of understand what it's like, but the career phases for a kid actor are, you know, the same to an adult who's at the same company for 30 years, all of that gets condensed into like, okay, from nine to 10, I'm establishing myself from, you know, 11 to 12, I'm making inroads. And by 13, I'm diversifying my brand and, uh, you know, starting new business verticals and da, 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 da. And then by 17, you have to hit certain criteria um, in order to be able to make that transition. You've mm. got to have some kind of big break or you've got to have enough money in the bank account that you can sustain this awkward transition. Um, and that's sort of the fear, right? It's like, I'm going to be forgotten and all of this work that I've dedicated my life towards, like I don't have any backup plan because I didn't get to go to school and yeah. my family's falling apart. So like, uh-oh, like what am I going to do if I don't succeed at this? Again, lots of fear. Um, and so there was a particular audition this one was for the movie The Hunger Games. And um, and I was so familiar with the character, big fan of the books. And I knew that the character was written to be lean. Um, you know, she wasn't fully emaciated, but she was, you know, she knew how to hunt. So she wasn't as hungry as some other people, but she certainly wasn't overfed. Mm -hmm. um, and so that kind of just sparked a little bit of the eating disorder mentality. And I said, okay, I... I see you, but I'm, I'm not going to fall for it. Yeah. You know, I, I can, you know how it goes. Like, yeah. I can manage this. Um, and it turned out that the training that I put into the process just kind of, it was a slippery slope. Mm -hmm. And I found myself, um, you know, very underweight again and s struggling mentally, physically, um, starting to have all kinds of physical symptoms and yeah um and i was like all right that's i i gave my all and i i understand why i did i have compassion for that decision and i knew if not this then this is gonna have to be a turning point of some sort well for you at 18 years old to have the the consciousness to one realize that in the moment especially in a time and we're about the same age in our 30s where we didn't talk about it growing up our parents didn't you didn't yeah. at school you didn't at work and at 18 you decide to check yourself into rehab mm -hmm. and you said it's not like a one week two week i was checked in for two weeks and it really really helped me but three months that's a long time yeah two weeks is a full time in there yeah it's it's it, it saved my life and it gave yeah. me, it opened my eyes to things I never knew about mental health, which I realized wasn't rocket science. I just was never taught it ever in my life. Right, whether, right. Whether it's coping mechanisms or what to look for in yourself, the warning signs yeah. of you are an act. Like you just mentioned the slippery slope of, okay, it's like, okay, if I do this, or maybe a little bit, it's like my friends might be able to have one drink. Mm -hmm. I 
can't do right. that. That's not that's not me. And it's that with anything. And so having that realization had to be maybe at the time you didn't realize how powerful it is, but now looking back, that had to be a, a life changing moment and life changing six months to a mm-hmm. year for you, right? Absolutely. Uh, it was intense, and yeah. and it was really uh, uncomfortable. <laughs> um, I don't know how it was for you, but when all of your comforting, self-soothing behaviors are <laughs> removed, um, the way I described it to someone once was in treatment, you know, we had to sit physically still. We couldn't stand. We couldn't move around. And it felt like there were a, there was a swarm of flies all around and, you know, landing on you and nagging at you. And these are all these uh, agitations and, and cravings yeah. and all kinds of stuff. But you have to just sit there and tolerate it. And you think, okay, I did it once. Like, can I go back and do the thing again now? Like, And then you realize, oh, if I'm really making this new choice... I'm going to have to learn how to ride this wave mm-hmm. again and again and again and again. And and it is, wow, like it can feel like a beast. Um, and and it takes time. Yeah. And um, I needed I needed larger help. Um, I know some people are able to make shifts without uh, that level of care. Yeah. And I'm like, that's amazing. I wasn't able to handle that. Um However, it really set a new foundation for how I approach life. And it wasn't like I woke up, felt better, was healed, and mm-hmm. and everything worked out in my favor. It was more like, okay, stress is going to be inevitable. Challenges are always going to present themselves mm-hmm. in some way, shape, or form. If I can't rely on this old thing, what's the new program? What's the new protocol? How can I get a little bit ahead of it? Maybe have some preventative strategies, yep. but also what can I do in the moment when it's the high stakes moment? And what can I do after the fact if uh, you know something severe or negative happens? Um, and it's it's been a it's it's <laughs> that in itself could be your full time job. <laughs> yeah. Well, you think you think about it, and you put it in a great way of like when you're in that situation, maybe not the same situation again, or you're having a bad day or a bad moment. Now we both and anyone that that's gone to therapy or or checked themselves in or done treatment, you now have tools that like, Mm -hmm. it's up to you to use them, but at least you know what to do now. I had no idea what to do before. Where was the manual? There wasn't. And that's what like, I I speak at schools all across the country now. And I I think teachers are on the same page because they want to help their students now too. But like, we should be learning mental health along with math, English, and science. Yes. I, I, I don't understand why we're not. And I'll give kids credit. And we talked a little bit about scrolling on your phone and how that might, you know, be a problem sometimes. And, and people make fun of kids nowadays that are younger that are on TikTok too much or social media too much, which I understand there has to be a healthy balance. Mm. But as being someone that's been in schools and over, you know, I did a tour to 30 states in 30 days and went to like Whew. a bunch of high schools and middle schools. And hearing how they talk about mental health and how they view it at this young age Mm. and they're talking about coping mechanisms or how to help each other at third, fourth, fifth, all the way through high school. That really inspires me. And it it just, we didn't have any of that. You felt like you had to hide it. I'm sure when you, when when you checked in, were you nervous about how the industry, how your team, how how future jobs are going to look at you? Yeah. I flew under the radar and I didn't open up about it until I chose to let that be disclosed. But I, you know, showed up and I was among other people my age and right away, you know, they were like, oh, you're the person who's in those movies that are on the shelf of DVDs. Like, this is weird. And, you know, I had to kind of say, can you, can you please, like, please don't say anything. I would really like to just focus on healing. Mm-hmm. Um but yeah, there's like the stigma and, and it is, like you said, improving. Young folks seem to be gaining language for yeah. it. I will say now what I'm, I feel some concern around is when we find language to label, I also hope that we talk about holding the labels in a 
in a helpful way mm-hmm. as opposed to perhaps um you know there's it's a journey when you receive a diagnosis you've got thoughts and feelings about it yep. maybe some judgments maybe some fears maybe some relief as well like yeah. oh there's a word for it yep. um but sometimes it seems like it leads at least in my case it can lead me to ruminate on the challenges and to feel more limited by it or to feel um, like I'm sh- I'm shrinking my life to accommodate something. And what I would like to do is continue learning tools that increase my resilience so I'm able to say, even though I deal with anxiety, I can still go have that difficult conversation. Yeah. Now it's a balance. Like you said, some days it's about just setting the boundary mm-hmm. and knowing your limit and capacity. But other times I think I hope that young people gain language that's empowering, but also behaviors that empower them to say, okay, even though this is hard, even though I'm dealing with this, what is possible? Yeah. You know, and to find that their unique capacity to navigate something with resilience. Um, and that's really kind of the, the spine of uh, the company I started with my sister, Movement Genius. Um, these are all of the mind body techniques. We saw that. Mental health was usually focused on talk therapy. Physical health was usually diet, fitness, exercise. Mm-hmm. And you're like, wait a second. They can they can connect. <laughs> yeah. And and not only can they, they do. Yeah. So if you just focus on trying to change your mindset, but your body's still on fire, mm-hmm. you gotta learn some things that help you cope with the embodied changes. Yep. Um, so yeah, I'm glad to see that young people are learning, but we all we all need more of it we definitely have (laughs) have a long way to go but but your story and you kind of threw me off and i want to dig if i can Mm. um you mentioned how the rock bottom was a rock bottom but it wasn't the rock bottom yeah (laughs) what if you if you feel comfortable sharing what was that rock bottom because i look back for me i think you know i spent three months suicidal every second of every day at the top Mm. of my career And I don't think I will ever get to that moment, but I have the tools and resources I think now to Mm. know how to handle it if I get anywhere close. Mm. But you mentioned the the rock bottom you thought was at 18 checking in and getting help. Mm. Um, What was that other rock bottom that you discovered? Yeah, I think the reason I thought getting help was the rock bottom was because of uh, society's view of something like rehab, even though at the time I actually was like, I think this is a a healthy decision Mm -hmm. like I think it's actually a turning point um but it turns out that I had been avoiding everything that I was feeling for years and so when I started to come online again and my body was noticing what was going on a lot of it felt quite unmanageable Mm -hmm. and I no longer could just disassociate or uh, dissociate and and check out I was like all right I'm doing the work here now I got to feel it and process express release um but one of the rock bottoms that followed well there's a few (laughs) um one of them happened with my um faith paradigm like I said I kind of I joined at a certain age seeking a certain thing then I discovered that I am queer and that sort of I had to (laughs) go back and revisit certain things I had learned and internalized and thoughts I had towards queer folks at the time that were very homophobic and harmful. And so I had to deconstruct. And anyone who's gone through a deep mindset shift knows like when you're floating in liminal space from one way to another way, it's like you're suspended in midair and yeah. you're like, I don't I don't feel like I have a foundation. Yep. I, and your the sense of purpose, the identity, everything just gets real confusing. Yeah. So there is some confusion there. Then I learned about some unfortunate things happening with my business affairs. And that set me in a place where I wasn't able to continue the path that I, I thought I was on. And uh, it no- knocked me back quite a bit. Then after that, I learned about, you know, I'll save this for a, a, a deeper memoir at some point. Um but I – basically, it was almost like a, dom- a, a series of dominoes mm. and each area of my life that was holding it up. Faith, health, family, finances, it just all 
like one after the other, significantly difficult things happened. And at the end of that series, a particularly traumatizing experience happened. And that's where I was like, all right, I don't know how to cope with this number of things from every direction. Um, And I, you know, found myself thinking about ending everything and um and that felt like a different low compared to just saying my health is out of order because when I went into rehab I was like I know that there's something on the other side Mm -hmm. of this but when you reach a point where the mind can't see anything on the other side that felt like a different level of of hopelessness I've felt that hopelessness before. Like I had mentioned, I battled those suicidal thoughts. I It started at 14. It would come and go. And eventually, like you described it, the domino effect of things happening in my life put me in that spot where I felt like I could never get out of it. Hmm. The thought of suicide, how much did that scare you in that moment where you, you didn't see like a fix like you did by able, by being able to go to rehab or work on this? Right. Like, Did you just feel lost in that moment? I uh, – I – When you, when you can't see any possibility, you know, yes, there's an absence of hope and there's a feeling of despair, but then there's also just an empty numbness as well, where you're like, I'm almost more scared that I'm feeling nothing over mm-hmm. this because this is an intense thought. And yet I'm, it's not like a piece, but I'm like, sort of on the ride and not in control of it yeah. seemingly you know it's how how it felt for me um and as your mind toys with ideas further and you know it for me it kind of like it came back it was recurring and it got more clever each time um the one thing that gave me a sense of hope that felt like man that must have been some like that was a, a life-saving thought wherever it came from was realizing I there was a strong part of me that did want everything to end, but it wasn't life altogether. It was the life I had been living. It was the version of myself that I, I was ready to shed. Mm-hmm. It was habits and relationships and things that needed to change and I I just had that small little thought that said I hear you I just want to remind you you may feel like you want to end everything perhaps you do want to end some things but it's not life in itself and I know that that's not everyone's experience you know like very different relationships to those kinds of thoughts and also different opportunities to work through them mm-hmm. and access to community or not. Um, but that was like my, it, it helped me in a very p- specific moment um, that could have gone a different direction. I, I can relate to that because you mentioned like, you don't retrospect in that moment, you can realize this small little glimmer of hope where mm-hmm. I don't want to end my life. I want to end some things that are happening in my life or relationships around me that are making or contributing to the way that I'm feeling. And that's something that I always bring up with people. I have two things with mental health. Number one, do something, call somebody, reach out to a mm. friend, try something. But but number two is feelings are temporary. Mm-hmm. And in that moment, you might not realize that those feelings are temporary and you might yeah. think it's the end of the world. But I, I just love the way that you put it. And, and I think- it might not be the experience that everyone has when they're right. battling suicidal thoughts, but I can relate to it. And I think a lot of people can, if you're experiencing something like that and you go, wait, I just want this and that to end. And also realizing that you can't rely on other things or other people to make you happy or to get right, you out of right. that. Yeah. Um, I think is really powerful. And so thank you for opening up about that. Mm. Um, what, what was that your first suicidal thought? Um, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't particularly the first time, but it, it escalated. Mm. It like deepened and it became 
more action oriented and it it wasn't just you know ideation at that point mm-hmm. um and that's when i was like okay uh what yeah <laughs> um yeah and i was just i was thinking what did where did my mind go i wanted to oh something else that came later was experiencing depression in a way where sometimes i'm pretty shocked at um the nature of depression and the way that your mind really can just find the bottom of a well and Mm -hmm. look up and go there's no way I'm getting out of here um that brought in a new dimension of low thoughts that I had to I had to learn different coping strategies for the other was like circumstantial Mm. and then this one felt a little bit more like internal mood yeah body chemistry like I've got a I need some different tools and I did choose to go on medication low dose for my body it's very sensitive but I needed that for that experience yeah um because I had I started trying a lot of different things that were you know non-medication and they helped but I was like oh man this body of mine's got some (laughs) it's got some severe places it can go to and I know a lot of tools now, but I still need a little bit more help with this. So I'm a proponent for like finding whatever the combination Mm -hmm. is that you can access and that meets you where you are. The answer is different for everyone. Yeah, That's what, you know, therapy and medication might work for me, just therapy or maybe just talking to family and friends or or picking a healthy coping mechanism might help you. Mm -hmm. The answer is different for everyone, but like you said, being open to trying something new, yeah. especially if you're in a moment that's new to you. Mm-hmm. And your story, collectively, you've had moments throughout, and I give you so much praise and respect, and I'm proud of you for the way you've taken an action each mm-hmm. time you felt it, because that takes courage. And a lot of people don't have that courage. And so by sharing that, I think you can help people maybe find that inside themselves. So that's mm-hmm. a long way for me to say thank you for sharing those. You've heard Allison and I both talk about struggling with our mental health, feeling lost and alone, and we finally had to ask for help because we realized we couldn't do it alone. But the answer is different for everyone with how we take care of our mental health, and that's why I want to tell you about man therapy. And guys, I am talking to you because, look, we were taught playing sports to just rub dirt on it, play hurt. Don't show that you're feeling sad or you're emotional or you're weak. No, that, that, that's not true anymore. We have to take care of our mental health. We have to be vulnerable and be open with how we're feeling. And that's why I want you to go to mantherapy.org to take their 18-point head inspection. It's a quick two-minute test that asks you basic questions about your everyday life, you know, how you're feeling, how you're doing, to try to take the best care of your mental health and give you amazing tools, resources, and tips so you can be the best version of yourself. Once again, that's Man Therapy, and you can take their two-minute, 18-point head inspection by going to mantherapy.org today to find the best answers for us as men to take the best care of our mental health. Suicide can be tough to talk about, and that's why The Happiness Project is helping break the stigma. After losing their classmate Nick, his friends knew they had to do something to help save lives. So, The Happiness Project was born, a clothing brand to raise awareness for mental health and suicide prevention with t-shirts and hoodies to start a conversation and let people know they are not alone. To learn more, follow at Happiness Project on social media and use the code MENTALGAME for 15% off your first order at happinessproject.com. And I want to dig into the tools that, you, that you've talked about, mm-hmm. uh, especially Movement Genius, your company that you started with your sister, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it combines mental health, physical health, and just into one whole holistic experience, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. You can take care of your mind, body, and emotions all in one place. Um, Essentially, we wanted to offer stress relief techniques, um, coping skills, and tools that you can use to, uh, you know, not only help yourself feel better in the moment, Mm -hmm. um, but start to shift how your nervous system responds long term to situations. So uh, in the moment, you know, if you use something like 
a technique called progressive muscle relaxation. Um, you can, you know, tighten and isolate different muscle groups, hold it for a period, and then connect to that sensation, notice where you're holding the tension, and then consciously from 100 to zero, completely release the tension, feel the, the difference, notice, you know, this is how relaxation feels, this is how tension feels. Do a couple of rounds of that. Um, that has some quick, kind of like the quick payoff benefits. Yeah. Um, but over time, if you start to use these tools just as your micro resets throughout the day, it can be two minutes, one minute, three minutes. You can say, hey, I got to run to the restroom and go in there and, and shake out the stress for, for three minutes. Like there are lots of simple options that don't require expensive fancy retreats or equipment mm -hmm. or even medication. Again, if you need medication, I hope you have access to it. But there are these somatic tools, these mind-body tools that help you feel better in the moment and then over time start to build that resilience. So if you feel frequently overwhelmed or stuck in a rut, you're just in this pattern that you can't seem to get out of, um, this helps you process, express, release mm -hmm. um, the stress or emotions that you're experiencing and then feel like you can manage the day, whatever it brings. Um, and I'll make sure if we want to do like yeah. mental game as yeah, mental the discount. Yeah, mental game works. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. Um, so with Movement Genius, we host weekly classes with experts. They can be therapists. Um, they could be movement practitioners. Um, but it's always like come as you are, you know, at your own pace, mm -hmm. no expectation of previous experience. Um, and it's just a warm and welcoming environment. Those are virtual classes, but then you also get this library of all of these tools. So you can think of it if you've seen like Headspace or Calm with meditation, Yeah. but these are just a little bit, it's a, a broader spectrum of tools sure. for those of us who can't just sit still for 15 minutes and meditate. We've sat still for like 30 minutes. I, 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 know, I right? I'm struggling with this, but it's been a great conversation. <laughs> yeah. I got a couple more questions for you. The, this feels like and I know you're still working on projects mm. and still acting and pursuing the creative arts, but this feels like a purpose that you found through your own experience. Has that been part of your healing journey too? It's an interesting question because yes, the tools themselves have been a part of the healing experience, but I did need to make a conscious decision upon starting the company that I wouldn't just follow my previous workaholic pattern. Mm -hmm. Becoming a founder, uh, you know, you're wearing all the hats all the time and the work hours aren't going to be any <laughs> shorter than they yeah. are when you're in entertainment. Um, so I had to set up new guardrails mm -hmm. and uh, systems of accountability. And thankfully, I was able to build the company with my sister, um, who we, we've been able to get closer because of it. We didn't actually know each other that well beforehand, wow. ironically. Um, but it, it ended up being great as business partners because we like didn't have any sisterly drama. It was just like, <laughs> all right, who are you as a, you know, an, a fellow uh, co-founder? Yeah. So, um, but we established some guardrails for ourselves. We said, if we're starting a wellness company, we must commit to not ruining our well-being That's in smart. the process because um, we've seen it happen. And actually recently, both of us were starting to teeter on burnout mm. and certain kinds of fatigue and that kind of depressive low mood and it felt more persistent. And we were like, all right, we got to – we're going to have to calibrate. It didn't mean that we got to stop – fulfilling our commitments, right. but we did end up integrating more of our own tools that we share with people and saying, hey, checking in, did you do your like a 10 minute reset today? Hey, did you take a three minute break between your meetings? Hey, are you drinking water? Like mm -hmm. sometimes for us, it's not about like, oh, you can perfectly just make your schedule ideal yeah. and only do things you feel like doing. That's not the case. Um, but it's saying, all right, I'm going to be in this. What's in my control? What can I do about it? And um, and yeah, so in some ways, it was a reflection of my healing journey. In other ways, I have to consciously choose not to work the old pattern. Well, I'm going to ask you then a very direct question. Okay. How are you doing now? Oof. Um, Today, this, this temporary time, whatever you want to address it as. But yeah, how are you yeah. doing? Yeah. So the last several months have been really, really difficult, hmm. um, which, you know, isn't shining through in this conversation at the moment. But I can tell you that um, we're in the family, we're dealing with some terminal illness and um, 
there are a lot of different challenging things happening. I'm also working on a couple projects that have been uh, psychologically very demanding, um, and I'm unearthing a lot of old stuff, mm-hmm. and um, and and then just the nature of what's going on in the world as well. Yeah. Uh, f- really feeling it. So I uh, again started medication to help with this period, but I'm also slowly re-implementing all of these practices at the moment, um, and I need it. Yeah. I would say right now, you know, if ten out of ten is like you're feeling like you're just golden. I'm, I'm like five on a good day. Mm. Like it's a, it's not a, a great season. Um, but I do have hope. Mm. Um, and tools. And tools. Yes. Uh, and those tools really are my lifeline. When I say like we started the company, we use the tools that we share with people because they have been a lifeline. Um, but you know, what's I think been missing that I might try to reintegrate is, it's easy for me to just focus on work and not do anything creative or inspiring. Yeah. Um, and I think there's something about what that activates in the brain that can support, you know, if you're dealing with depression. Um, so I'm I'm going to try to maybe find, like, pick up guitar, even mm. if it's just for three minutes. Like, yeah. I'm not over here trying to learn how to shred, but I think I need, I need a little extra help right now. Well... Thank you for being open and honest this entire conversation, but yeah. specifically with that, because before we started rolling, I told you it's been a heck of a day of, of AC yeah. not working. We're sweating here on set. I know, set. I'm like, sorry. I've um, got sweat beads. I have had cameras go down. I just moved in here in LA like three days ago. So it's yeah. just a lot. I'm kind of in that same probably ballpark where you're out of a five, six out of 10, just yeah. super stressed with life. So thank you so much for having this conversation and wanting to help people. The last thing that I ask on the podcast, unless I miss something you want to touch, is advice to someone that, you know, if it's an athlete, they they, they want to follow that person's footsteps. Mm. Or, you know, I, I don't know how many kids grow up and think, I want to be in a movie at three years old or work yeah, at four yeah. or five years old. It's very, very unique. But there are kids out there that look up to you, that watch mm. you in movies, on TV, um, and say like, look, I, I want to be that one day. Mm. I, I want to be able to have that job and to be able to be on set or be on stage what advice would you give a, a young kid that has those same dreams that, that you were able to to achieve? Well, um, in addition to this constant self-discovery uh, journey that we're all on, which I will like always be a strong proponent for, be as curious as you can about everything, um, I would also say a concrete piece of advice is to maybe take inventory of where you think some of your strengths are uh, and maybe some of the opportunities or areas that you feel like you need to grow in Mm -hmm. in order to fulfill said dream. Um, And so that can be helpful in the self-development process of like sometimes we only focus on things we're really good at because it doesn't feel as fun to focus on our our quote-unquote weaknesses. Um, But finding your balance in like interweaving some of both Um, And then when it comes to like the systemic pursuit of something, I think there has to be a lot of grace given to ourselves that there truly are so many variables um, that can create barriers for certain people or um, other challenges that you may have to surmount that I didn't or I did that you didn't. Mm -hmm. And so there's going to have to be some patience, grace, and understanding that even if you become the the best of the best, all of these other things still have to fall into place right. for that seeming, you know, p- perfect dream to come true. So I would encourage some creativity and flexibility mm-hmm. as you develop yourself and you try to get into the right places or meet the right people. Be open. Yeah. Perhaps like what, how you thought it would look at once was just the catalyst to get you going. Mm-hmm. And then like a different path or a similar but slightly different path might open up and um, to be open to that. And then the, the final thing that feels concrete, for those of us who love structure, um, I would you know encourage and invite opportunities to experience uh, more f- flow and mm-hmm. what you might learn from spontaneity. And then for those of us who love flow and going with the feels and following intuition all the time um i would see 
what you can learn from establishing some sense of routine. And then usually you'll find your kind of perfect, perfect, you're, you'll find your balance yeah. of structure and flow that seems to work for, for you with your personality. Well, thank you so much um, for that advice and for this whole conversation. Again, sorry for the AC issue we I, have I'm here. I'm just like, I'm sorry, I'm glo- I'm glowing over well, here. Well, no, we're, we're, this is our gl- this will be our glow up podcast. That's right. um, we'll call it that. But Allison Stender, <laughs> thanks so much for coming on the Mental thank Game you. again. Uh, Movement Genius, use the code Mental Game. Yeah. And thank you guys so much. We'll see you right back here next week on the Mental Game. And that was an incredible conversation with Allison. I am so thankful she opened up and told her mental health story with me here on the Mental Game. You know, those suicidal thoughts she talked about didn't happen that long ago, and and this was one of the first times she's really opened up about that, and and I'm so grateful she trusted me with her story. Again, go to Movement Genius and use the promo code MENTALGAME to get some off your order. She has an incredible company she started with her sister to help all of us better take care of our mental health. Next week on The Mental Game, another surprise guest, and we are going back to the NFL. That is your one hint. We'll see you right back here next week on The Mental Game.